I have a job I'm doing right now that is to create a gift for a person that um, worked for Radcliffe University, Harvard University. And what it is, is a still life essentially of a bunch of books. And the books are going to be open to various pages and they're going to be titled various uh, titles that will uh, reflect this person's um, life with respect to the university and the job that they had in the university. Pretty straightforward in a way, but not without its challenges. And one of its challenges is I'm doing essentially a drawing of a bunch of books and the books themselves will be containing drawings and lettering on them. And when you do a drawing of lettering or drawing of a drawing, we'll just make it simple. Let's say you're doing a drawing of an artist working on a drawing and how do you convey that realistically? And it's really sort of a fun way to do that. It's a fun challenge because um, you're abstracting. You're, a drawing is an abstraction of the real world. Um, what you see in a drawing of a drawing is an abstraction twice removed. And um, it's just like, how do you make that, how do you make it obvious that that's a drawing of a drawing? Um, to make that perhaps more obvious, imagine you're drawing a interior of a house and the house has a window in it you know, wall, and the wall also has a picture on it. Now, you can certainly imagine drawing the window and looking out at the window and drawing the trees, but what if there was a drawing on the wall, framed drawing on the wall, that also was a drawing of trees? Do you draw the trees in the drawing the same way you draw the trees that are outside? And that's sort of fun. Like, how do you how, how do you make it obvious? Clearly, one subject is actual trees. The other subject is a piece of paper with lines, not random lines, but lines sort of sitting on top of it. And it's it's the. Um, the rendering, I would think you would do it differently because you're drawing a different thing. You're not drawing trees, you're drawing paper. One of the fellow artists in grad, grad school with me in Madison, Wisconsin, was a figure painter. And he would draw the figure and paint the figure with really, really bright almost neon colors, bright pinks, bright oranges, very, very unrealistic. You could still tell it was a figure. In the most cases, it was a naked lady. And you could tell it was a naked lady. You could see her boobs and her legs and her arms and everything. But it was just really bright. It was like you, you took a real painting and then just with your picture app on your phone, you saturated the colors to just go crazy. And anyway, the... And I could understand it. I could look at the drawing, the, you know, the figure, and I could understand how his eye saw what he drew, what he painted. But he also showed the figure 
in his studio, and in the background were the paintings he did earlier of other brightly colored naked ladies with boobs. And I, but the paintings were painted the same way that he painted the real model. And I just thought, well, that doesn't make any sense. If he sees, you know, a beige color as bright pink, wouldn't he see bright pink as a neon pink? Wouldn't it even be crazier bright? So, in my estimation, he sort of failed in, in, in rendering the, the, the image as well as he, he could have because of that, um, the fact that he wasn't consistent. So anyway, with me, I try to draw drawings, a drawing of a drawing, I try to make look as if it was seen through the same eyes as the drawing of the other parts of the illustration. So it's always an interesting challenge. So in this case, this is meant to be a book that's opened up. The, the eventual thing is going to be the still life of a bunch of books. And this is going to be one of the books, and that's going to be a drawing of an atlas. So if I was hired to draw a map, I would draw the map very carefully and get out my ruler and draw straight lines. But because I'm drawing a drawing of a drawing in a book, it's removed, you know, two or three times from an actual map. And how do I, how do I convey that? Um, and this is what I'm trying to do now by not drawing with a ruler, drawing freehand, removing it one step further. And I may decide I'm going to label these buildings and I'm going to sort of Greek in the, in the letters. They'll look vaguely like words, but I'm not going to make them necessarily be readable because that's going to not fit with the rest of the drawing. It'll, it'll jump out at you. There's a, not a very famous painting that Van Gogh did of a pile of books. And he also sort of failed because when it came time to write the titles of the books, he just took a paintbrush and wrote the letters out. He didn't paint the shapes of the letters, he just wrote the letters. And it ended up your eye goes right to those things. They might have gone to those things anyway because they're words and you you tend to look at things that are words. You tend to want to read them so your eye goes to them. But the I would have preferred if he had painted them or rendered them a little bit more like he rendered the rest of the drawing. So, for me, in this particular drawing I'm doing here, I may put labels on these, but I might not. I, uh, I might pretend there's a key, you know, that's written somewhere, that has numbers, I, I don't, I haven't decided yet. Um, you know, the grass areas I'm going to draw stipply, but not as evenly as I might if I was actually making a real map. Um, again, it's doing a drawing of a drawing, and 
it's it's an interesting an interesting uh, exercise. That's the word I want. An ex interesting exercise in rendering. Interesting exercise intellectually. Just interesting to think about. I was watching a documentary yesterday about multiple universes and evidently the scientists want you to believe that there are an infinite number of multiple universes out there and because there's an infinite number of multiple universes there's infinite number of Pierre Gustafsons that are drawing infinite numbers of Harvard Yards, and in one infinite universe, this isn't actually called Radcliffe Institute of Advanced Study, it's called the Brown Institute of Advanced Study, because in one of those infinite universes, that was the name of this university. And maybe this building was named something else, and it just makes your head go mental. But one of the things that they had said in this thing is because we have these infinite universes. Um, anything is possible, including, I mean, it, it, it went because of little particles, the fact that particles do weird things. Therefore, there must be infinite universes. And I thought that's, well, that's a, a leap of faith. You know, why should this suddenly be true because there are infinite ones. Why, why, do, why do they have to be duplicates? Just because there's infinite. There's infinite numbers, but there's no two number twos. There's only one number two in an in, in infinity. So why should there be two universes that are alike? Anyway, I'm digressing. There was a point I was going to be making but I, of course I can't remember what it is. So the person, this building right here that's depicted right there in that drawing is that building right there. So that one I think I'm going to make dark because that's... I want people's eyes to go to that. The other, and then this garden is also part of their bequest. So this is the focal point of this map of those two things. The rest I'm going to draw with hatch marks, and then I'm going to add stippling in to represent the grass. But I'm going to do it in a sketchy way, again, to make it look like the rest of the drawing. I wish I knew what I was going to say about the, well, the universes. But, who knows. I'm going to have these go this way. When you draw with cross-hatching or hatching, which is what I'm doing, that's another thing that you you're forced to contend with is hatching. These lines are supposed to represent shading, but lines can also represent lines. And how do you make that, 
how do you differentiate between a line that's a line and a line that's a shadow or a shade? And um, it's another another conundrum, another thing that just makes your head spin. This is meant to be. See, I'm drawing a shadow right now. The, the page is curved. So there's shadowing meant to be on this edge. And so I'm drawing that differently than I drew the rest of it. So anyway, I think that works. Again, a drawing of a drawing. I can explain that right here. So let's say I was drawing a a face. And you know, here's how I know bless. Let's pretend that's a good drawing of a face. And now I'm drawing an artist drawing that face. So the artist is going to be drawn like this. I'm going to be drawing the artist with that amount of detail. So therefore, if x is to y and y is to z, you know, you have to sort of make this drawing. How do I, how does this drawing then? So that could be this removed once. And if he was doing a drawing of a drawing, you know, maybe even the rectangle would, would hardly be noticeable. And you know, So it's just, it's a fun little exercise. Because you're, well, you're drawing a still life. You're not drawing a person. You're drawing a drawing. A lot of people, when they draw from photographs, if they're drawing a figure or a portrait from a photograph, they sometimes say, well, gee, why does it look so, why does it look so flat? Well, you weren't drawing the person, you were drawing a flat piece of paper with smudges on it. Of course it's going to look flat. What do you what do you expect? So, my advice to all of you people out there, not that you're asking me for my advice, far be it for me to even imagine you're asking me for advice, but if you are interested in drawing people, draw people. They don't have, you know, just go and draw. It doesn't make any difference what kind of person it is. But don't draw from a photograph, because you're drawing a still life. You're drawing a piece of paper. And that's not going to teach you how to draw very well. This is going to work out. I'm going to, I may have to tighten this up a little bit, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be able to know what this is going to be like until I actually put it in with all the other elements. And the reason I'm not drawing an entire drawing from start to finish, the reason I'm not actually doing this, is because chances are the client is going to say, oh, I forgot something. Because that's what, that's what clients do these days. They forget things. Oh, can you put one more thing in? Well, I can't put one more thing in. I have to move all sorts of things around. I have to tear the drawing up and start over. Here's a, the best analogy I have for this is 
let's pretend you're having you have a round dining room table and you're having eight people for dinner one two three four five six seven eight eight plates eight water glasses you're setting the table eight wine glasses eight other wine glass, one, one's white, one's red, oops, knife, spoon, knife, spoon, etc, etc, fork, 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 and now someone says, oh, I'm going to bring a date, or my date is sick, I'm going to come alone, so let's pretend, let's do it that way first, let's say someone is sick and this person isn't going to be here. Well, you can just remove that place setting and take the chair away and have your dinner, but it's going to look really, really bad. So to make it look good, you have to move. One of these things can stay the same, but every one of these things has to move and it's spaced out evenly so that it looks nice. So you have to move seven plates, seven water glasses, seven wine glasses, seven other wine glasses, seven forks, seven knives, seven salad forks, seven spoons, seven dessert spoons, seven butter knives, and seven chairs. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. You have to move a hundred What's 11? 77. You have to move 77 things to make it look nice. And that's the same way when I'm doing a drawing. If someone says, oh, can't you just add one more thing? No, 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 no. I just can't add one thing. I maybe can add a word, or I maybe can add a period, or dot an I, or, you know, you can't just add something. So you have to plan ahead. So I know from experience, I've been doing this a lot, that these sorts of jobs, especially when they're designed by committee, um, there's usually some thing that is forgotten. And I end up having to add, oh, they were also the chairman of the this, that, and the other committee. Okay, well, I have to add that. I can you know, do a easy job of just adding it to a title, chairman of the XYZ committee and the XYB committee. I can do that, but that's not as nice as you know, creating something special for that. So with all of my rambling that I've just done. I'm not sure I'm entirely, I will be happy with this. I just need to, I need to add a couple of things, a couple of lines to tighten up certain aspect, aspects of this. Right now it's a little bit too loosey-goosey everywhere and maybe it's going to be tightening up the actual book that this is going to be depicted as a page in rather than uh, changing any of the drawing. But something needs to be uh, tightened. It's a little messy. And it's supposed to be a little messy, but it may have to be a little a little less messy in spots. Ta-da!